Okay. So welcome to HOMT 611 Events Management. This is our first session. And in today's session, we will be discussing an introduction to events management to give us a good foundation of events management and what it is about and to serve as a precursor to what we will be going through in terms of topics in the remainder of the sessions. Now, for every session, there are certain learning outcomes that we hope to achieve. And for this particular session, the learning outcomes are as follows. First off, you'll be able to appreciate the nature of events and events management. You will also be able to explain the common characteristics of events and identify some specific types of events. You will also be able to understand the motives for participating in an event. Because you will bear with me that everybody goes to an event with a different idea in mind and with different expectations. So we will try to understand the motives with which people participate in an event and how it can influence events management. And then finally, we will try to explain the nature and the relationship between hospitality, tourism, and events management to be able to see how they are interlinked. So on that note, let's get into the lecture, starting with why events and events management. And before we can answer that question, we need to be able to understand what events are and what events management is. So what are events? Events are non-routine occasions that are set apart from the normal activities of daily life. So you can't call going to work every day an event. You can't call going to church every Sunday an event because these are routine occasions. However, non-routine occasions can be described as occasions that do not occur in a routine manner or do not occur very frequently, right? Like a festival or a funeral or a birthday. These are all occasions, but they are not routine, right? Good. Good. That is why we say events are non-routine occasions. And these are usually intended to either enlighten, celebrate, entertain, or challenge a group of people through the creation of valuable experiences. So here are the key concepts I want you to take from the discussion that I just did regarding events is that first of all, they are non-routine occasions, so they don't occur all the time. And the fact that they involve the creation of valuable experiences. So in thinking about events, you need to think about creating some kind of experience for the participants in that event, such that once the event is over, they can be able to tell you about how it felt to go through and experience that event, how it felt to be part of that event. And these valuable experiences determine whether or not that event will become one that they would want to engage in at a future time. How many times have you gone to a party and you have, you have had a very good experience that you wish the party was organized again, again, again? It happens often, doesn't it? Yeah. You go to a particular wedding reception and you, you wish the, the reception doesn't, doesn't come to an end because you are having so much fun. These are the reason why we talk about the creation of valuable experiences, because it is these experiences that make the people not want to go home. It is these experiences that make the people want to participate in events of a similar nature at a later date and in the foreseeable future. So the creation of valuable experiences are very important because especially for you as a professional, it is in the creation of these valuable experiences that you are able to get customers or the owners of these events that you organize to come back to you again and again. And it could also lead to referrals because once that valuable experience is created, customers engage in what we refer to as word of mouth, such that they are likely to share this experience with other individuals who will also share it with others. And it will create a snowballing effect that will lead to future business for you as an event professional. Lisa, I hope that makes sense. Yes, 
So the creation of these valuable experiences is very, very important because if the experience is not valuable, the participants will not see the need why they should talk about it or to spread the positive word about it to other individuals who could be potential participants or customers in future for the event organizer or manager. So now that we know what events are, what is events management? Events management is a part of the larger field of tourism and hospitality. That includes the planning, organizing, and execution of events. So you will bear with me that tourism is all about different kinds of events that are held at different times and places to try and enlighten, entertain, celebrate or challenge a group of people who in this case are usually referred to as what? In the case of tourism, who are these people referred to as? Ladies and gentlemen, these people that we plan and organize these events for. They are tourists, please. They are tourists. Thank you, Cassie. So they are tourists, right? And tourists, yes often rely on hospitality services during their stay at these various tourist destinations, right? That is why events management is a key aspect of the larger fields of tourism and hospitality. And in doing all this planning, organizing and execution, you are aiming at delivering value to all the parties involved. And when we say all the parties involved, we are not just talking about the tourists here. Through creating the valuable experiences for the tourists, you are also creating value for the employees of the various organizations and institutions in the tourism and hospitality sector. True or false? Mm, true. Good. You are also creating value for the larger community in which these tourism and hospitality organizations and institutions are situated. True or false? True. Good. And ultimately, you're also creating value for the larger national economy because the more tourists come in and spend money, the more they contribute to the betterment of our economy. True or false? True. Good. So now at this point, we understand why events are important and why events management is important, don't we? Yes, we do. Good. All right. So now that we know that, let's move on to talk about the characteristics of events. Now, events are comparable to services. And because of that, you will notice that they have a lot of the characteristics that services have, in addition to other characteristics which we will discuss. And these include uniqueness, perishability, intangibility, ambience, personal interaction, Rituals and ceremonies, fixed time scale, labor intensiveness, and budget requirements. So we will take each of these characteristics one after the other, and then we will break them down. Now, as we go along, in the event that you want to make a contribution or you have a question to ask, please feel free to raise your hand or draw my attention, and I'll give you the opportunity to do so. Please, I hope that is okay. Yes, please. Okay. So now let's talk about the first characteristic, which is uniqueness. Now we are saying events are unique because each event is and will always be different. For those of you who attend a lot of events, let's say weddings or parties, you will bear with me that no one party or event that you attend be it a wedding or funeral, is the same as the other. True or false? Mm, yeah, true. Good. Good. Regardless of how you try to, to place similarities at each of these events, they will always be different. One wedding will always be, be different from the other. Right? Again, experiences mm. cannot be perfectly replicated. You can go to a particular wedding and it is so beautifully organized. And because of that, you may decide that, okay, you want the same people who organize that wedding to also organize yours. But you mm -hmm. will bear in with me that even if the same people organize your wedding, the way they organized that previous wedding that you enjoyed so much, the experience from that previous wedding cannot be perfectly replicated in yours. Do you agree? 
Yes. Good. Mm. That goes back to the concept of uniqueness. And this uniqueness comes about as a result of the different elements that are put together at each event. These may include the participants. You will not get the same group of people who attended that wedding attending your wedding. And you know, participants play a key role in oh, how yes. an event turns out. You know that? Yes, though. Good. The atmosphere of the event, depending on how the participants come, it can create a certain atmosphere at the event. I've gone to weddings where the in-laws were not getting along. So the atmosphere was tense throughout. <laughs> Nobody wanted to laugh or have fun and step on somebody's toes. Right? I've also gone to events where everybody is so happy, the families are so happy that they are joining together that the atmosphere is fun from beginning to end. Everybody is on the dance floor from the beginning to the end. You can't even sack them from the dance floor. You can't even close. <laughs> Nobody wants to go home. Right? Okay. These are all elements of the atmosphere and they are contributed to significantly by the participants. Also, yes. you can talk about the surroundings. Like I said, no one wedding planner is the same as the other. Even the best wedding planners, even the best festival organizers, even the best funeral organizers, sometimes they, 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 they do not give off the same level of quality in designing the surroundings at the different events. So Unique Floral will design the surroundings of one wedding and you enter there and it's like you have entered heaven. <laughs> and you design another wedding and you enter there and it's like, well, well it's basic which is determined by so many different factors, right? Even the food. Yeah. The same caterer will cook for two yeah, events. At last. Right? The same caterer can cook for two events, but the taste of the food will be different. Beverages, the kind of entertainment, all of these things determine how unique an event is. Everybody was talking about Kensi 2020 for so many months because of the kind of <laughs> entertainments they had at the wedding. The artists just kept coming from corner to corner. Mm. They were able to bring foreign artists. And they were not the first rich family to have a wedding in Ghana. Other rich families have had weddings. Yeah. But the, the kind of entertainment that was there the atmosphere, the surroundings, the food, and other variables that they brought out. The main attraction in this wedding was, was the unique cars that were put on display. Yep. Right? All of these things contribute to the uniqueness of different events. And because of that, you cannot compare one event to the other. And that is why we say that events exhibit the characteristic of what? Uniqueness. Also, we can talk about the fact that events exhibit the characteristic of perishability. No matter how much you enjoy the event and you don't want to go home, you definitely have to go home. <laughs> the event has to come to an end. It can't go on perpetually. At some point, it will have to close. And you can't say that you are keeping it in your bag to continue tomorrow. <laughs> that's why I don't understand those who carry bottles of drink and glasses from parties and they put them in their bag and they take them home <laughs> are there any caterers here Jifa caterers are always missing glasses and cutlery and plates because people want to store the experience including the food and take it home right but events cannot be stored for future consumption Harriet please your hand is up go ahead yeah, madam, I, I had a question uh, with the first first slide. The, okay, let's go the back there. Yeah. When we were talking about um, uh, why Kenzie's uh, wedding was talk of town for three months, but other other um, rich people's weddings. Yeah. I think um, social media too was a factor. Mm -hmm. The publicity was a factor. Good. For, Good. Like everything. So, uh, <laughs> Otun Fo's daughter got married and nobody really heard about it. Yes. Yes. So the yeah. social media 
part because this day and age everything is on social media and then it allows everybody to be part even if in your Good. house your comments alone Good. and then you're but sharing you know it's also a choice right yes yes Good. yes it is good so that is what makes every event unique because other rich people have had their weddings and events and they choose not to make it social media official. Yeah. So that made their event unique and shrouded in mystery. Yeah. And today, it's nobody even knows the wedding dress that Otunfo's daughter wore. Mm -hmm. But everybody knows how many dresses the Kensi people wore, how many times they changed the colors of the dresses. Yes. Good. So good contribution there, Harriet. Very good observation. Thank you, madam. Good. So continuing with the perishability, like I said, events cannot be stored for future consumption. No matter how much you enjoy the event, you cannot keep it and continue tomorrow. Once it comes to an end, it has ended, right? And the perishability of events also have to do with the facilities where these events are organized. That is why you realize that a lot of event spaces will usually collect a deposit. Even before they agree for you to host your event there. Now, this deposit is some kind of insurance, right? In case you book their venue for the event and some way, somehow, a certain turn of events prevents you from actually having the event on that day. It means that the, the space and the time of the event space for that day has perished and there's no way they can get it back. So the deposit that you have made will help cover the losses of having missed the opportunity to give out that event space to another event organizer for that particular period. So you realize that once they take that deposit and the event finally takes place, then they collect the balance or they give you a time to pay the balance before your event takes place. However, have you realized that even if the event is venue is paid in full and the event is somehow canceled, some event spaces will not give you a refund. Do you know that? Yes, yes though. And they will not give you a refund because they could have rented out the space to someone else for that particular period. Yes. But because you had booked it and paid for it, it prevented them from renting it out to someone else. So whether your event came on or not, the space for that time has perished. So the money you paid has equally perished with it. Still on the issue of perishability, Many items and props that are used in vents are often unique and cannot be used again. Harriet, please go ahead. <laughs> There's a contribution I, I want to bring across. We, we planned for a birthday party that was last year mm -hmm. when the, we didn't know COVID was going to make things worse for us. So we planned ahead. We booked mm -hmm. a before it was in March. Yeah. We booked in February. But because of COVID and the lockdown, it was with one of these big restaurants. It was a birthday party for 50. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's okay for me to mention the name. But because it was that there was a lockdown, they told us uh, we they can't refund our money to us. We pay 10000 But in, if we can get food worth that amount, they, they were ready to give us food, but uh, they can't refund the money we paid for the place exactly yes right? because and they were willing to give you food because they had already bought the ingredients yes so they can use the ingredients to prepare food for you and give it to you but for the yes, money you paid for the space they can't give it back to you because it has what yes. perished yes so another excellent example harriet please everyone mm -hmm. i hope it makes things clearer Yes, madam. Yeah. So it has perished. They will never give you a refund. Right? So that is it with the concept of perishability. So, um, madam, uh, there's another, uh, even in the, in the hotel management scenario. Yes. Um, because, because hotel rooms, they have similar characteristics to this perishability. Uh, if somebody is booking, especially uh, when the person is booking for a lot of people to come and occupy, 
Yes. Um, the different hotels have different rules, but they will normally charge you 25% of the required amount of the stay. Exactly. Then, uh, because you may not, they, they, they put it in mind that what if you didn't come to occupy all the rooms? That's true. So if you, if you come and cause any inconvenience, that 25% is not given to you. Yeah. Yeah. So, Another um, excellent yeah. example, Kasim. Yes. Because if you have booked all the rooms, it blocks them from giving it out to anybody else. Other people, yes. Yeah. Yes. So at that period, it has perished. So another excellent example, Kasim. I think this Thank has you. made the whole concept very clear to understand. Right. Yes. Thank you for sharing your experiences. All right. So the next concept is intangibility. And here we are saying that events are intangible. We cannot see them. We cannot touch them. Right. But we can only experience them. So you can only tell the outcome of an event after participants have actually experienced it. That's why you cannot tell how well an event was or how well a person's hotel stay is until they are checking out. Then you can yeah. ask them to take an exit survey. Or until the event is over and you ask them, how was the experience? How did it feel? So because you cannot be able to gauge how good it's going to be, because of the intangible nature, events managers and organizers often use a lot of tangible elements to create good experiences for participants in events, or in this case, in the um, hospitality industry, for room occupants, to make them experience some kind of positive emotions. So you realize that when it comes to an event, when you go to the event, they will give you um, a brochure Right? And sometimes they'll offer you a drink at the entrance before you enter. The mm -hmm. hospitality people to also do the same thing. They call it the welcome drink, isn't it? Yes. Good. So by doing that alone, they have gotten you to relax and feel welcome. And then they'll provide you with somebody who will usher you to your seat. If you are going to an event like a wedding reception, right? Or if it is um, a hotel stay, the concierge will come to you and, and walk you to the reception where you can be able to talk to the receptionist about your booking details and then they will give you all the details you need, um, check you in, give you your room key. And then the concierge will then again continue on to walk you to your room. And some concierges will go as far as describing the premises to you as they are walking you to your room, right? Telling you about the basic mm -hmm. things that will make your stay comfortable. So it's this way yeah. to the restaurant, it's this way to the pool, it's this way to the lounge area. If you need anything, this is the, 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 the number you call from your room, right? And sometimes you go to the yeah. room and then they'll do these complimentary designs on the bed. They'll put mm -hmm. some flowers there. They'll put it in a special shape. There's some complimentary chocolate or a basket of fruit. All of these things are tangible elements that help to create experiences because yeah. of the intangible nature of services, right? The same for events, like I was saying. They will try to create some experiences using tangible elements like entertainment. Some people will go to um, events and they'll be so bored because perhaps the entertainment was poor. The DJ was not playing <laughs> the latest tracks. They didn't get a good DJ or there was mm -hmm. no live band. I know some people that if there's an event like a party and there's no live band, don't go. <laughs> especially some older people I know because they enjoy live band music a lot. They don't like all this recent uh, music that is played by the DJs. No, they want live band. So I don't play old high life songs for them to dance. So <laughs> event organizers and managers have to think about the intangible nature of, of, of the events that they organize and make sure they have enough tangible elements to create a valuable experience. Because without these tangible elements, the participants will find it very difficult to get the value that they are expecting out of the events that they are participating in. Please, I hope that makes sense. Yes, Doc. Good. Now, moving on from intangibility, we can talk about ambience, right? And ambience is one of the most important determiners of the outcome of an event. 
which once again is experience based. So you realize that from the definition of events, remember I mentioned that there were two key things you needed to take away from the definition of events. Do you remember? Yes. What did I say they were? Um, Non-routine. Good. And, and then um, um, creation of valuable experience. Good. So you realize that almost all the characteristics we are talking about are giving us the reason why the creation of valuable experiences are so important. Do you realize that? Yes, yes, Good. yes. From uniqueness to perishability to intangibility, and now we are on ambience. Ambience, right? yeah. Because the creation of the right ambience at an event can either lead to the success or failure of an event. And ambience cannot be forced. It has to be actually thought about and planned. So you realize that you go to an event and you see that there are certain items that are strategically placed to create this ambience. Now, when you go mm -hmm. to reception halls for weddings, you can see that they have all these, what do they call them? The, the draping that falls from the roof. There's a name for it. Is it cascading? There's a word for it. But you see the, the drapery of the white fabric all over the room. And then the strategic position of setting colored lights. Yep. Posted against setting flowers. So you realize that if the room is full of pink flowers or white flowers or roses, they would usually use these pink and purple lights to accentuate the flowers and the ambience in the room. And they will usually use the color scheme that is within the room. So if the color scheme is purple and blue or purple and yellow or green, you will see that this color scheme is represented in the lighting in the room and then in the drapery that has been used to decorate the room. All of these things are not just being done for formality sake. They are being strategically thought through to create some kind of ambience. So you realize that you enter into certain event spaces and you're, it's like you are in another world. <laughs> and, and sometimes you have to step outside to see, okay, where did I enter? I'm still in Ghana. Exactly. I'm still in Ghana. I'm still in Ghana. <laughs> yeah. Because they have chosen the element in the room so much that they have created such a beautiful ambience. But we need to bear in mind that ambience is not just created by this non-physical element I'm talking about, like lighting and colors and drapery and the positioning of, of items. Ambience is also created by the participants and how they interact with each other and how they react to different activities and entertainment that is put together at the event. Harriet, your hand is up. Please go ahead. Yes, Doc. Um, so we uh, we normally have events uh, in and outside Accra. Yeah. Um, there was there was this time that uh, we chose Senchi. That was uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. We chose Senchi because uh, we were always having um, uh, conferences in Kumasi, Accra. They not not voter, so we yeah. wanted to try Akosombo. Yeah. We went there and then just. By the entrance, it's like everybody in the car was ah, they're green. Everything is green. Mm -hmm. Things are so natural. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the weather is changing. Yeah. And then we went at dog. We went to the rooms, and then they wouldn't touch. Oh wow! Of place. Yeah, <laughs> I've not been there before, but I've heard people talk about the wooden touch that they have put to the place. It makes it very authentic. Yeah. Yes, and their food especially was so good. See, wow. you will come out and then you, you can decide to um, swim in the pool or you go for a boat ride. See, yeah. it, it was it was a training program. We yeah. ended up not having a training at all. <laughs> it was it oh, was God. fun, fun, fun. It, it was fun, fun, fun that oh, we came back and then the following um um conference that date we chose everybody voted for senchi exactly. you know since then we've been going for senchi for like five six times like yeah. <laughs> we yeah. always yeah. Been last you, guys are, you guys are rich yeah uh, <laughs> no as 
see it's a whole lot. I can't explain everything, but this I is... totally understand. There's a lot that happens yeah, at the so back, back end. A lot of deals and arrangements the ambience, and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The ambience alone made yeah. us choose Senchi over and over again. Exactly. So you, yeah. you see a practical example of how ambience can make a difference. Because now, because oh, yes. of the experience that they had, they are choosing Senchi over and over and mm -hmm. over again. Yeah. 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 So the experience is very, very important. And thank you for sharing that with us, Harriet. Oh. Thank you, Samada. So now we've seen a practical example of how ambience can, can play a key role, right? In creating these valuable mm -hmm. experiences we are talking about. Next, we can also talk about personal contact and interaction, right? An event may have the best ambience. It may be the best place, but if you are not there with the right people or you do not like the people that you are with, it could create the worst kind of experience for you, right? And aside from yeah. that, events usually begin and end with personal contact and interaction. Yeah. Right yeah. from the organizing and planning stage, people have to interact with each other. People have to get into contact with each other. And depending on how well they are able to communicate and share ideas and agree or disagree to different things determines the quality of the experience that is created once the event is complete. So people attending events are often themselves a part of the planning process in that they commission the event and they are counting on the event organizer or manager to execute the vision that they had to a T. And in executing that vision, they are creating something that they believe that the people that they have invited to the event will be able to enjoy even as they interact with each other at the place. So you realize that in organizing weddings, I don't know if in Ghana here, they do it a lot. The organizer will always ask, are there certain family members that I should be wary of? <laughs> Have you heard that story before? Yeah. Huh. Who, is there anyone I should watch out for? Are there some people I shouldn't sit together <laughs> at the same place? Are there some people that have to put one in one corner of the room and put the other one in another corner of the room? Because how they interact with each other can either create a good mood or ruin the entire mood at the wedding. So these are different levels of personal contact and interaction, which can either mar or enhance the event experience. And they are a key characteristic of events management. Sometimes you even realize that it may not have to do with the people attending the event but the service providers at the event. Yes. I have attended events where participants or attendees have fought with waiters and waitresses before. <laughs> it happens a lot. Yes, because they didn't give them the food they wanted. They didn't give them their drink. They didn't sit mm. them at the correct place. They asked them for something and they didn't give them. So many things. And sometimes it is mainly because a lot of these waiters or attendants are not properly trained to know the yes. dynamics of these events and how to handle themselves in these scenarios. And these are all yeah. aspects of event management that as an event manager or organizer, you need to think about. Because they form part and parcel of personal contact and interaction, which are a key characteristic of events that lead to either the creation of a valuable or invaluable experience for participants. So that's another key characteristic we need to take cognizance of. So sometimes I will walk into a restaurant, Jifa, and then I'll meet some waiters and waitresses and I'll ask myself, these people, how did they get hired? Ah. <laughs> the owner desperate, couldn't the owner find anybody? Because it's almost like they are doing you a favor. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. These are all aspects of personal contact and interaction. And they can mar your event if you do not take care. Next, we can talk about rituals and ceremonies, right? And this is a key characteristic of events because you realize that 
almost all the events that are practiced in, in the world currently are either a metamorphosed version of a previous ceremony that was held in the past or an old ritual that was done and had a negative connotation and has over the years been rebranded and redesigned to connote some kind of positive experience and therefore turned into an event that people can gain some kind of enlightenment or entertainment from, right? So we say that many modern events are fossilized or reinvented versions of old tradition. A typical example is that the wedding ceremonies that we have these days. They are the reinvented version of the old marriage traditions that we had, right? From our grandmothers and grandfathers times. So because mm -hmm. of that, you can see that they are performed in accordance with social norms and tradition, such that you see elements of the old ritual or ceremony in the new reinvented form. Right? For instance, elements of the old traditional marriage ceremony that we had can be seen in our current reinvented marriage ceremonies that we've been having. Traditionally, our forefathers didn't know anything about white wedding, true or false? True. Traditionally, when someone wanted to get married, they would just go to the chief's house or see the elders, get a bottle mm -hmm. of schnapp, get some, some uh, I remember, the, I was told they even used to sometimes even use food stuff like yam and tomatoes and things, get some elders and family members, go and see the family of the woman, agree, exchange drinks, sit down, do some small meal, and the marriage is done. <laughs> no, no rings? No rings. I think that <laughs> mothers and fathers didn't wear rings. But once that ceremony is done, everybody in the village knows that this is what means. Yeah, okay. plasma. Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh. Even then when they were not wearing rings, everybody knew that they are married couple and these are the boundaries. So today there are some traditionalists who do not wear wedding rings. Mm -hmm. They only do the marriage the traditional way, and they, they are that's why PNDC Law 111 views traditional marriage as actual marriage. Okay. Okay. So even if they don't do white wedding or they don't go to court to sign or anything, once there was a traditional marriage, the law views it as an actual marriage. But in the reinvented version of the marriages now, you can see what is happening. Mm. Yep. It has to be kente. And the kente <laughs> has to be done by pistis. Uh, the other <laughs> or one of these fantastic designers. <laughs> and the, the dowry has to be carried in by, by plenty people. Yeah. It has to be wrapped in fabulous wrappers and boxes and... Then it shows you're getting married. Then it shows you're getting married. And you need to have a, a, a train of, of people following you, your friends, mm -hmm. yeah. wearing the laces, dancing behind you. These are all reinvented, ex exaggerated versions of the traditional <laughs> customary marriage ceremony that we, we, our forefathers knew, right? But right now, that is the norm, and those are the kinds of events that are being organized. Not to say there are not people who are also practicing the traditional form of it. Even funerals. Look at how funerals are now organized these days. Mm -hmm. You realize that so much has changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been reinvented so many ways. Such that right now we even have companies that specialize in organizing funerals. Mm -hmm. As yeah, soon as the death occurs, they are called and they take over everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. The family doesn't mm -hmm. even have to lift the finger. Mm -hmm. Once you have money, good. But previously it was not so. Right? Even even previously. You realize that some families will not even want outsiders involved in yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. To do it among themselves because they see it as a sacred family occasion. But these days, people get up and they dress up and they go to funerals that they don't even know who the person, <laughs> who the person is that has died. Because it's an event and there'll be free food and drinks. 
So this is where we come from when we talk about the fact that events are rituals and ceremonies because they are reinvented forms, right? Or fossilized versions of old traditions that we knew. So you can take something that has been old and reinvent it into something new and turn it into an event that can start to become something that can even be commercialized. That is why all of a sudden, people in Kweu Abetifi were, were celebrating Easter. People used to go to Kweu, their hometown, to celebrate Easter. But when they decided to reinvent the Kweu Easter, what happened? They brought in the paragliding. Do you remember? Yes. As soon as they brought the paragliding and they brought the foreigners and they publicized it, they turned Kweu Easter into something totally new. Then it became Kweu Kweu. And now it is an annual event that people look forward to. So, like I said, you need to be creative as an event manager. Because the rituals and ceremonies that are the key characteristic of events gives you room to be able to be very creative and innovative when it comes to how you plan and organize events, depending on whether you are going the commercial route or the non-commercial route. Please, I hope that makes sense. Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Good. Next, we can talk about the fact that events have the characteristic of a fixed time scale. Some events are very short, meaning that they may take place over the span of, say, a few hours. Like, for instance, a sword cutting ceremony. Sword cutting ceremonies usually do not go on for long. Maximum one hour, one and a half hours, sword cutting ceremony is done. We can also have events that are long, like award ceremonies that can start <laughs> on one day and end at dawn on the following day. <laughs> <laughs> there was that at 7 p.m. on Saturday and they end at dawn, 6 a.m. the next day. Oh, yes. Because they have to do red carpets, they have to do the performances, they have to give out all the awards, and then when they finish, they have to do the awards after party, mm -hmm. which will end at around 5, 6 a.m. So you need to understand that's an event manager that depending on the type of events that you're organizing, it could either be long or short. So you have to know the kind of event and the, the time scale it has right from the beginning. And this will determine how you plan the sequence of activities during the event. So if it is a short event, you know that whatever sequence of activities you put together should be able to run such that they can be able to end within that short period of time. And vice versa if it is a long event. Please, does that make sense? Yes. Good. Also, we can talk about the fact that events are labor intensive. Now, the more huge and complex the event is, the more labor intensive it is. Look at how much labor goes into planning all these huge extravagant weddings that we have been seeing organized. Mm -hmm. There are people who are fixing the, the metal frames for the tents. There are people who come and put the covering over the tent. There are people who will come and, and fix the lighting. There are people who will come and do the seating, the chairs, the tables, cover them, put the plates, put the name tags, fix the flowers. People who will come and fix the food table, put the dishes out. When it comes to hospitality, we have people like the concierge who open the door, who carry the luggage. We have the reception people who are responsible for talking to the clients or, or the, the room occupants, booking them taking their specifications. We have people who work in the kitchen who are responsible for cooking the food, who are responsible for servicing the restaurant. We have people who are responsible for cleaning the rooms, cleaning the bathrooms, laying the beds. We have people who are responsible for doing the laundry. All these are various kinds of labor that are required for an event to be successful. And as an event manager, you need to be able to successfully manage the activities of all these people to ensure that they do their job and they do it properly. True or false? Oh, true, 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 true. That's true. Good. So <laughs> as an event manager, it is your responsibility to understand the extensiveness of the labor involved in that event that you are engaging in. 
so that you can be able to ensure that you are have put in measures to properly manage all these people and the different tasks they are doing, which are all contributing to the success of your event in creating that special experience we are talking about. Otherwise, there'll be chaos. Yeah. yeah. Each person will be doing their own thing. Each person will be his own boss. And at the end of the day, it will end up ruining the perfect event that you have planned and the customer will be very unhappy. Harriet, please go ahead. Yes, I have an experience to this one too. Please share. Um, let me... <laughs> it was a big funeral. A funeral that the president was attending, chief of staff, vice president, everybody was coming. So, um, dog, you can imagine uh, such a funeral and then we were part of the organizers. Uh, my boss, boss, mm -hmm. boss was the organizer. Yeah. And then since it was my boss, we used three months to organize that funeral, to plan Good. that funeral. So here we are talking the, about what? Time scale? Yes. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> and then we were looking at 5,000 um, people to attend. Wow. Uh, both, uh, yes, it was That's a very big funeral. For a funeral. 5,000? Yes. Yes. Last year, 5,000. <laughs> so uh, it was a funeral that the president was coming. So you can imagine, we, we even built along the line, we used like three months to build a place where the you know um, executives will come and eat because yeah. they couldn't even go to any hotel oh. to eat. Cause, yeah. yeah. So um, labor intensive, we were, we were more than, we were more than 50. Even those who were cooking, we had we had like five different um, caterers. This one will, will, will be for junior staff, senior staff, management, um, uh, you know, US, UK, like everybody was thinking of something. And then we had to meet at every point in time to get like, where have you reached? Um, the update, feedback, update, mm -hmm. feedback, yeah. the rains. We, 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 we took into consideration the weather, everything, because yeah. we, we, can't, we can't plan a funeral and then uh, rains and then maybe too much sunshine was or something. Mm -hmm. We had to construct roads. It was a whole lot. And then, trust me, Doc, it was a successful funeral that the feedback was great. Yeah. Like everybody, everybody was wondering how we did it. Yeah. It's like seriously, five thousand people came, but they were all uniform. They were all, all taking care of. Yeah. Every, so those who were who were entering will pass here, exit, and then they were conforming to all the protocols. Nothing happened that we regretted. No chaos. Nothing. The yeah. president came. The cars were packed. He came to sit. The vice came. Chief of staff came, and then they all left. No complaints. Nothing. Yeah. So Monday that we left. Mm -hmm. So it's like everybody was doing uh, his or her part to exactly. make this happen. Even though we exactly. were fifty, my my boss, who was the chief organizer, was yeah. able to um, yeah take off everybody. Um, you know, the instructions and everything went exactly. down well. No shouting at anybody. Like, if you are tired, please take time off and go and rest. Yeah. We don't want any casual peace. So it was a whole lot. It was a whole lot. And yeah. then uh, it was a successful program. Yeah. And that is exactly what we mean when we talk about proper management. Mm -hmm. right? Because the leadership was there. Everything had been yes. planned and organized. So everybody knew what they were supposed to do. And I'm yes, sure your yes. boss was having periodic meetings with everybody. Where have you been? Yes. What is left? Yes. What do we have yes. to do? Are things going well? Mm -hmm. That is the controlling to make Every sure that event. we have planned and things are moving according to plan. So yeah. once again, thank you for sharing, Harriet. <laughs> Welcome. Doc. Because the more labor intensive the event is, the more you need to be on top of the management. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will mess up. And congratulations on a successful event, Harriet. Because Thank 5,000 participants is not a small number to handle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was my first time seeing such huge participants. Exactly. And that brings me to budget requirements, right? Imagine these 5,000 participants Harriet is talking about and all the little things they had to do. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was expensive. Very. Yes. 
But the fact that it was expensive didn't mean that they had unlimited funds. There was a budget. Yes, there was. And everybody yeah. had to stay within the financial uh, constraint that they had been allocated. So budgeting requirements with events are very important. As an event manager, you can't afford to go into any planning situation without knowing the budget that you are working with. Because knowing the budget that you have at your disposal will let you know how far you can take your planning and organizing. So if it's a labor intensive event, however, you do not have a very huge budget, you need to plan such that you can get certain labor who will be able to perhaps multitask so that one person can do the job that two or three, you would have needed two or three people to do. I hope that makes sense. Yes. That's one of the ways in which budget constraints can make people become creative. At the same time, too, it helps you to make an intelligent choice of what to include in the event and what not to include. And the caterers do this a lot. So you tell them your budget and they tell you that, okay, based on your budget, this is what I can give you for small chops. This is what I can give you for main course. And this is what I can give you for dessert. Yeah. So that way you are able to keep your expenses within the budgetary constraints that you have. Because otherwise, you know, expenses can vary depending on the type of event that you're organizing and the customer you are dealing with. Yeah. And sometimes I think the caterers will bear this with me. Customers often have very lofty expectations sometimes that do not match their budget. Yes, yeah, that's true. So I want this, I want that, do this, do that, give me this, give me that. But you ask them how much they have to spend and then you just, you just want to, to go and hide. Because yeah. the kind of things they are asking for and the amount of money that they have to spend, you know, this, mm. there's no way this would be possible. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, as an event manager, if you exceed your budget, thinking that the client will accept to top up or pay the difference, you have made a mistake. Yes. If they have something they want to top up, if they say, oh, I'll top up, I'll top up, please let them know that you are working with the budget that they give you now and not what they are going to add on later. Yeah. So yeah. you realize yeah. that the, the planning and organizing and leading here for the event manager becomes very important because as you see things progressing, you keep updating the clients with regards to the budget. So this is what we spent, this is what we have left. And therefore, based on what we have left, you will not be able to get this, you will not be able to get this, but this is what you can get. So in a nutshell, budgeting is very important because as an event manager, most of the time you are not spending your own money. Mm -hmm. And usually when clients part with money, they want to get the best value out of that money. And that is why budgeting is very important. Yeah. Because once you know the budget constraints you are working in, you can be able to plan such that you can give the client the best value within the budgets that they are able to provide. Yeah. So I hope that makes sense. Yes. yes. Okay. So on that note, we've come to the end of the characteristics of events. So now that we know the characteristics of events, let's talk about the classification of events. You know that events in any industry are multifaceted, right? Now, yes. relating it specifically to hospitality and tourism, we can talk about various events that are organized from time to time. However, to be able to properly classify these events for the purposes of planning and understanding, we can be able to categorize them into two main classes based on their size and their type. So first, let's talk about event classification based on size. In terms of size, we can talk about mega events. Now, mega events are the ones that yield extraordinarily high levels of tourism, like the Olympic Games. Tokyo 2021 is coming up, right? Yeah. I remember when Ghana hosted, is it Cannes 2008? Mm. <laughs> it brought in a lot of tourism to Ghana. People from all over Africa came to Ghana because we were hosting the tournament. And that is what is referred to as a mega event because they have a high international audience. And because of that, at that period of time that the event is taking place, the location 
or the community where it is taking place gets a lot of national and international media coverage. So right now, everybody is talking about Tokyo Olympics, Tokyo Olympics. So the focus is on which country? Okay. Tokyo is a, is a city Japan. in a particular Japan. country. Japan, Japan, please. Japan, good. Right, so now the focus is on Japan and what Tokyo is doing. And a lot of people are talking about the COVID protocols they are putting in place to ensure that the event does not become a super spreader event, right? Yeah. And that is mainly because these mega events have long-term consequences. So for instance, after organizing this event and attracting this huge amount of tourism, it will definitely have economic implications because when the people come, they would want to visit different locations in the country. They will not just come for the tournament and go away, will they? Yes, they will yes. visit, they will visit location. different locations in the country or the community. They would go to different restaurants. They would sleep mm -hmm. in hotels. They would go out and shop. They would visit places. These all contribute to the, to the local economy in the city or country that is staging this particular event. Right, And usually associated with these events are the creation of infrastructure and event facilities. Remember Ghana had to build a whole, what did they call it? They call it the March village. Mm, they had yeah. to build March villages near the stadiums. Yeah, yeah. Where people could hang out during matches and after matches. Again, different hotels and institutions in the tourism and hospitality sector have to put in place certain infrastructure to be able to beef up their capacity to take on the influx of tourists that was going to come. So we saw a lot of hotels expanding their number of rooms, hiring additional personnel, expanding their menu, mm. looking at the number of people that were going to be coming in, right? So these are the typical characteristics of mega events and they attract huge numbers of, of, of individuals into the thousands. And like we've mentioned, typical examples of these include the Olympic games and then the World Cup. Now aside mega events, we can talk about regional or hallmark events. Now regional slash hallmark events are events that are usually designed to increase the appeal of a specific tourism destination or region. So assuming we were living in a particular remote village that nobody wanted to visit, we could come up with a unique event to be able to attract people to the village. Mm -hmm. And when we organize such events, they are referred to as hallmark events. Now, one characteristic of Hallmark events is that they are held in the same location every time. So they become synonymous with the place, right? Like Kweu Easter. Mm -hmm. Easter is now synonymous with Kweu, right? Yeah. Good. Fetu Afashe is synonymous with the Ogwa people. Mm -hmm. Good. Right? So they yeah, are held yeah. in the same location and they become synonymous with the name of the place thereby giving the place widespread recognition and awareness. So when people say Ogwa Fetu Afashe, everybody knows where Ogwa is. It's in Cape Coast. When we say Kweu Easter, everybody knows where the Kweu Easter takes place. It's in Kweu in the Eastern region. And there are people living outside Ghana who have never visited Ghana, but they've heard of the paragliding that takes place during Kweu Easter. And a lot of them come to Ghana just to experience it. And again, this will lead to increased tourism and media coverage for the area. Because like I said, for events like Kweu Easter, a lot of people come from different parts of the world just to experience the event. Mm -hmm. Other hallmark events we can talk about include the Carnival de Rio. This is a carnival that takes place every year in Rio, in Brazil. And it's a huge event. Has anyone heard of the Rio Carnival before? Yes. Good. Yes. Yes, please. Good. The huge floats with the people wearing the different costumes mm. and it's packed. Bad. Right? Tour de France is yeah. also another example. It's an annual event, right? For the cyclists. Yeah. Wimbledon is also another popular event. It's held annually. What is it associated with? 
What is Wimbledon associated with? Tennis. Tennis. Thank you, Bafo. Tennis. So it becomes synonymous, right? And these are all examples of hallmark events. We can also talk about major events. Now, these are not as, as big sometimes as hallmark events, but they are also large scale events and they attract significant public interest as well as media coverage. They also generate significant economic benefits for the, the organizing country or community. And they also occur annually, right? And they may include many of the large sporting events that we know of currently, like the, um, what, what do they call it? The Barclays Premier League. That's a major event, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Good. And it attracts a lot of people. But it is located and localized in where? In the UK, isn't it? Yeah. Good. The same for Chinese New Year. It is only celebrated by the Chinese people. But it's a large event because Chinese from different parts of the world often want to travel to China just to celebrate Chinese New Year. And it's celebrated mm -hmm. somewhere, I think, middle to end of January. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right? And it's a huge event for the Chinese people. So these are all examples of major events, right? Which is another type of event classification based on size. Then finally, we can talk about minor or local events. And these are events that generally fall into the category of events that are either one off or organized annually, primarily for a certain local group of people, right? So here we are talking about events that are localized to a particular town or city, right? Or depending on where you are in the world, a state or country. And these are generally staged for, for the purposes of, of social um, interaction, for fun or for entertainment, mm -hmm. right? You've heard of a shaman to the world. Yes. Is it, is, it a, is it a local event? Yes. Good. Good. And it's organized annually, isn't it? Yes. Yes, for the people of Bashar. Pardon? I was saying a shaman to the world. Yeah, a shaman to the world. Jifa, have you heard about him? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> can someone tell Jifa about a shaman to the world? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it a church program? Ah, <laughs> in, yes, you know. <laughs> uh, I of a shaman uh, to the world. <laughs> no, no, please, no. Hey, I think they organized it by Stoneboy. Yes, it's organized by Stoneboy. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, Bafo, yeah. thank you. It's organized by Stoneboy. Uh, but it's fans in Ashama. Uh, okay, then it oh, must okay. be a recent. It must be a recent uh, event. No, oh, it's, it's been there for about three years now. Is it three or four? Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm beyond of it, but I didn't know that was the name. Yeah, the one that Shatawale found ways and means uh, to. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, that's the name. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Thank you, Bafo. <laughs> Thank you, because I, never, I, I don't know about this. Yeah, it's a local <laughs> event. Just it's held um, in a shaman. Just in a shaman. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Bad spirit, bad spirit group. Yeah. <laughs> so now you see I'm not a prayer group. Oh, <laughs> 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 was I was thinking maybe it was. <laughs> yeah. Then we can also talk about the VGMs, right? Yes. It's yes, very man. local, exclusive to Ghana. When you go out there, you, nobody knows knows or cares about VGMs in other parts of the world. They only care about Grammys and BET awards and, and stuff. Yeah. But VGMs <laughs> is very important to Ghanaian artists. Mm. And recently, three awards. Yeah, three awards now is also gaining popularity. But it's also yes. a minor event, right? Yes. Yeah. Then we can talk about the Glit Style Awards. Yes. You've heard about that one too? Yes. Good. Good. A lot of our festivals too can be classified as local events because you can see that they are localized to a particular 
area either mm -hmm. a town or a city in a particular region. So you realize that some events can be classified across depending on size. So an event can be a hallmark event and at the same time, a local event. Mm -hmm. You see that? Okay. Okay. Good. All right. So these are the four main classifications of events based on size. Now, apart from size, we can also classify events based on, what did I say? Apart from size, we said we can classify based on what? Type. And in terms of type, there are different typologies. So depending on the scholar you are, you are talking about or whose literature or work you are reading, you will get a different typology. Now, there are two main popular typologies that are mainly used when it comes to classifying events based on type. And the first one is by Getz97, and he talks about the typology of planned events using a specific classification. Then Sean and Parry also have their own typology of events, which is based on a combination of how complex the event is and the level of uncertainty that is involved in planning and organizing the event. So we will look at these two classifications starting from Getz 1997's classification. So he talks about the typology of planned events and he groups them into the seven, is it seven groups? The eight groups that we see in front of us, right? Starting yes. from cultural yeah. celebrations. So for cultural celebrations, he talks about festivals, carnivals, religious events, all the way to commemorations, right? Then he talks about events that can be classified under arts and entertainment. So these include mm -hmm. concerts, exhibitions, award ceremonies, and then other performances. Then he classifies business and trade events. So these are um, everything including fairs, sales, consumer shows and trade shows, meetings and conferences, fundraising events, among the options listed there. Then another set of, of events he classifies as sports competitions. And here there are two main classifications. It's either a professional sports competition or what? An amateur sports competition. And we see this happening a lot, don't we? Yes. In different sports like tennis, soccer. Mm -hmm. We have the professional league and the amateur league. Then they also classify educational and scientific events. So this is where they talk about seminars, workshops, congresses, and interpretive events. Then they go ahead and talk about recreational events, like games and sports and amusement events. And there are a lot of these in other parts of the world, right? For games and sports, for instance, there's this sport where um, you find people racing animals. Have you, have you seen that event before? Have you seen that sport before where people race animals? Yeah. yeah, horses. They race horses, they race pigs, they race dogs, they yeah, even yeah, race yeah, chickens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> yes, they race chickens. More recently, they've been racing babies. Have you seen that one before? Yes. yes. They babies. race babies, babies. Babies. Yes. Uh -huh. oh, see which baby that. can crawl the fastest to the finish line. Mm -hmm. some, some crawl and get back. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. These are all sporting events. Now they've been racing old age people too. Uh -huh. So those in their seventies and eighties, they organize sports events and they race them and they bet on them. These are all recreational events. Then events that are just for amusement, right? A number of the festivals mm -hmm. that we see being practiced these days in different parts of the world are for amusement. And we will see a few of them very soon. Then GETS also classifies political and state events. And these include inaugurations, right? Like when we are swearing in the president, we are swearing in ministers, a new speaker, we have investitures, then VIP visits, right? Like when the queen visited Ghana or when mm -hmm. uh, Mich Michelle Obama and Barack Obama came to Ghana. Yeah. Good, these are all VIP visits. And then rallies, which we usually see during the political season. These are all events. Then we can also talk about private events, which include personal celebrations. And these ones are very common. The rites of passage, right? Like the, the funerals, 
the weddings, the naming ceremonies. Then we have the family holidays, which Ghanaians rarely do. Except for, <laughs> who, except for those who save all their money and they carry the whole family to the UK or the US to visit aunties mm -hmm. and uncles for holidays. <laughs> then we have the anniversaries, right? 10 year wedding anniversary, 10 year celebration of life, um, 50th birthday celebration, 25 years wedding anniversary, among others. Then the social events, the parties, mainly the birthday parties, someone graduates, they have a party, right? And then the reunions, high school reunions, <laughs> university reunion. These are the different typologies of events that gets classified. So if I give you um, an exam question and I say, identify four types of events based on GETS 1997's typology of planned events. What will you tell me? If I say, tell me five types of events based on GETS 1997's typology of planned events. So it's the um, cultural celebrations. Good, cultural celebrations, what else? Arts and entertainment. Arts and entertainment. Events. Good. Private events. Good. Private events. Good. Political right. or state events. Good. Educational and scientific. And then, and then should, we bring, should we bring the examples? Like Good. So when you mention the general type of event, then you tell me examples of it, right? Okay. okay. Good. So first of all. <laughs> yes, first uh -huh. of all. So these are Getz's classification of events based on type, right? Now, the second mm -hmm. classification, like we said, is from Sean and Parry. And they did this based on the level of complexity of the event and then the level of uncertainty involved in organizing the event, whether high or low. Mm -hmm. now, you can see that on the complexity axis, the complexity is arranged from whether it is an individual event to a group event, to an organizational event, to a multi-organizational event, to a national then international event. Now you can see that as we move towards the right, it becomes more complex, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Because it's more complex to organize an individual event. It's less complex to organize an individual event, sorry, mm -hmm. than to organize a multi-organizational event or an international yeah. event. Good. Yeah. Now on the uncertainty axis too, we can see that it moves from low to high. So as we go mm -hmm. from the bottom, we can see that small private dinner parties are the low level, right? Yeah, Definitely, yes. there's a low level of uncertainty when you're organizing a small private dinner party because mm -hmm. you know yeah. what happens there. You know the number yeah. of yes. people coming and you are the only person in charge. But the higher you go on the axis, the more complex and uncertain it becomes, right? So look yes. at where weddings and receptions are. They are very high on the level of uncertainty, even though they are the individual mm -hmm. level. Yeah. Now let's look at political party conferences. They are in the middle there in terms of uncertainty, right? And also in the middle mm -hmm. there when it comes to complexity. But look at the highest level of complexity compared with the highest level of uncertainty. What do we see there? International Good. Olympic. International events like what? Olympic, Olympic Games. Games. Good. World fairs, world expos, because they are on the international level. And there are so many different moving parts that the level of uncertainty is quite high because you can't control what is going on with each of these myriad moving parts at any point in time. So these are the two main typologies of events when we are classifying events based on type, right? So now we understand how to classify events based on size and type, don't we? Yes, please. Good. So let's look at some specific types of events, starting from carnivals. So the word carnival stems from the practice of feasting on meat and then the associated revelry before the fasting required during the period of Lent, which precedes Easter. So for the Christians here, what period is Lent? Um, March. Early March, right? Yes. Good. So you realize that every carnival in, in, that is organized around the world is organized within that period mm. of Lent. 
So when you go back, go and look at the different carnivals we have. We have the Rio Carnival. We have Mardi Gras. You know of Mardi Gras? No. The New Orleans Carnival. New Orleans. No. We won't find out. Good. So that's your homework. Go and read around about the carnivals and the times that they are organized. And you realize that all of them are organized around the period of Lent. Okay. Right? Good. And that is the typical trademark of carnivals. They are events that are organized around the period of Lent. And they stem from the practice of feasting and revelry. That's why you see there's a lot of, of, of revelry involved in carnivals. Do you see that? Extravagant yeah. outfits, costumes, mm. a lot of food, drink, everybody having fun and entertaining themselves, right? So it's mainly a celebratory mm. event that is centered on public participation. So they need more people to participate in order for a carnival to be a carnival, right? Mm. So you see that carnivals are usually characterized by huge numbers of people or participants. And a typical example is the Rio Carnival, which is held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Right? And for this one, when you go online and you Google, you see so many videos on the Rio Carnival. And it, you see that even with the pictures we are, we are looking at, you see the number of people there. Mm -hmm. Several. Wow. Very colorful. Right, and it is held mm. every year starting from the Friday before Ash Wednesday and ends at noon on Ash Wednesday. And this is all during the period of what? Lent. Lent. Right, so every carnival is strategically positioned within that Lent period. Right, and, and the real carnival is considered the biggest carnival in the world with 2 million people per day on the streets of Rio de Janeiro during the period that the carnival is taking place. Hmm, two, million. two million people on the streets. Wow. Every day. That's a huge number of people, right? Mm -hmm. And this carnival started as far back as 1723. So it predates almost all of us. In fact, it predates all of us <laughs> and our ancestors. <laughs> So this is a typical event that is organized. In Ghana, they try to organize something that they call carnival. Right? Mm -hmm. The one that they used to try to do on the Osu Oxford Street. Who remembers that? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. It's never quite took off. Mm -hmm. They organized it successfully once or twice. And after that, it was all downhill from there. Yeah. All right? So that's it for carnivals. Now, aside that, we can also talk about conferences. Right, and, and this is a term that generally implies that the primary function of the event is to exchange ideas. So you realize that conferences are usually organized in the formal sector, right, by organizations yes. and educational institutions. So as academics, we yeah. attend a lot of academic conferences. And industry practitioners also attend a lot of practitioner conferences, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So here they meet to confer, to discuss, to share ideas, and to interact with each other. Yeah. And we see this happening a lot in Ghana. Even the political parties have their own conferences. Mm -hmm. Where they go to strategize. NDC said they are already strategizing and digitizing their pink sheets <laughs> for 2024. Oh. I'm sure they'll have a conference to finalize their plans very soon. Yes. Right. So a typical example of this conference is the, I, is the AABD conference, which is the Academy of African Business and Development Conference. And your coordinator, Dr. Kobi Mesa, is the secretary for this conference. Can someone see him in the picture? Mm, I'm looking for him. The gentleman in I'm the pink shirt with the phone and the glasses. Can you see him there? Okay, okay. Trying to take a picture. Bottom right. Yeah. Can you see him? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's right your coordinator. After, right after the white lady. Yes, that's but, Dr. Kobi Mesa. He's the secretary for the Academy of African Business and Development. When you see him, ask him about it. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's. Pardon? Oh, that's okay. 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 So it's an African, uh, it's a conference for African scholars. So not just scholars who are living in Africa, but African scholars who are also on the diaspora. 
So we meet there and we discuss our research areas, we discuss collaborations and how we can be able to do research that will confront issues that we are facing in Africa to help move the continent forward, right? And this is a typical example of a conference that is held annually. Okay, now apart from conferences, we can also talk about conventions, right? And these are very similar to conferences, but they have an, an, an emphasis on the more informal approach to their interactions. Remember I talked about the fact that conferences are more formal in terms of their interaction and collaboration. So you see it happening mostly among academics and people in the formal sector, right? Like industry practitioners. Yeah. However, conventions are more informal, right? So they are often used for large gatherings of fans or people of a particular sect or faith or a political party or religious group, right? A common features okay. of conventions include educational sessions, social functions and meetings to conduct the governance business of the organization. So you realize that political parties will usually have their conventions to strategize to, for the delegates to meet, vote, select party officials, select flag bearers, and then vote on who should represent the party in the various constituencies, right? Yes. Good. Now, these events are typically recurring with a specific established timing. So we know that political party conventions will usually start occurring as we are getting closer to the election, isn't it? Yes. Good. Right. The same for the religious conventions, like the Easter conventions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you've seen them around, eh? Yeah. <laughs> the Merkel people. They take the Easter mm. convention very personal. Yeah. Men's fellowship crowd don't take it personal like that. <laughs> well, did you have something to say? <laughs> yeah, Papa, are you a member of men's fellowship? <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. Wow. <laughs> right. So the Easter Foundation is a typical example. They meet, they discuss. They confer on various things and it usually takes place during the Easter period. So they'll usually travel to the place on Thursday and then they'll be there from Good Friday through to Easter Monday and then they'll return back home. Some of them like to have it on the outskirts of their main location. So you see that for Easter convention, church members in Accra would want to move out, say to locations yeah. in the Eastern region or in other regions. Yeah. Good, just to make it a fun experience, right? So that's another example of an event being the convention. Another one is exhibitions, right? And these ones used to be very popular in Ghana at the Ghana Trade Fair Center. Now, when we talk about exhibitions, there are two main types of exhibitions. We have consumer shows and trade shows, right? So exhibitions are typically events where artifacts are displayed, right? And at consumer shows, these artifacts that are displayed are usually open to individual members of the general public who often have to pay a small fee to gain admission. And I remember when I was young, my father used to take us to the trade fair all the time because they were always having these trade fairs where they would be exhibiting all kinds of things. And usually people will use it as an opportunity to introduce new products to the Ghanaian um, consumers, right? So they will show all manner of items depending on the theme of the of the exhibition at that time so the theme could be linked to maybe automobiles or travel and recreation or electronics or other hobbies or sometimes the Ghana trade fair um, exhibitions were just general exhibitions anybody and everybody who had something to exhibit could come and get a stall and exhibit mm -hmm. right and that is for consumer shoes However, the second type being trade shows are usually reserved for invitees only because they are not targeting individual consumers, they are targeting institutions. So you realize that the trade show usually is a theme, has a theme that is focused on a particular industry or sector, right? And it is usually done for manufacturers and suppliers to come and exhibit their products and try and sell them to specific institutions or institutional buyers. So you see that there are trade shows dedicated to health, right? Trade shows dedicated to IT and engineering, trade shows dedicated to manufacturing 
And here when you go, you will see mainly industrial items or products and services that are being exhibited for institutions and organizations in various industries to come and, and, and be able to source materials that they may need for their everyday business. Please, I hope that makes sense. Good. And recently they've been having a lot of them. Sometimes you even see that some of the embassies will specifically organize a trade show to showcase manufacturers and other suppliers from their country. I think China has one that they do in Ghana. Have you heard of that one before? Mm, what's the name that? I've forgotten. It's, it's the China something something trade show. The Turkish also have one that they do. Pardon? Bapo, please Dubai. speak up. I can't hear you. Dubai. Good. Dubai, there's one too that happens in Dubai. These are very common because that is the only way they can showcase what their countries have to offer and attract industries in Ghana to be able to participate. Okay, so the one that they have in Ghana, in fact, they try to do it over a week. It's called the China Trade Week. Trade Week, yes. And the most recent one was in August 2020. So they yes. do a whole exhibition for a whole week where they are showcasing everything that you can find from China. I think the mm. Indians also have one that they do. And like I said, it is usually organized by the embassies to try and mm. promote business for manufacturers and suppliers from their countries, right? Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So there's one that is done in Ghana by Ghana for Ghanaian manufacturers and it's called the Ghana Trade Show. The most recent one was held in, in um, between 30th January and 1st February 2020, right? And this is usually held at the Accra International Conference Center. Mm -hmm. And here they showcase everything from automotive to building and construction to consumer household products, food and hotel supplies, industrial and machinery items, IT and electronics, medical and mm -hmm. pharmaceutical products, among others. Because, you know, we have all these manufacturers in Ghana. Yes. Yeah. 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 So they, they organize it so that Ghanaian manufacturers and suppliers can also showcase what they have for, for firms in, in, in Ghana to be able to, to source from them, right? So these are, are for exhibitions. Then we can talk about fairs, right? Now, fairs are similar to exhibitions, right, at the consumer level, only that there's a slight difference for fairs. Now, when we talk about a fair, it is a gathering held at a specified time and place for the buying and selling of goods. So for fairs, it's just about buying and selling. Whereas exhibitions do not necessarily have to do with buying and selling, but they go a step yeah. further to try and introduce new concepts and products, right? Mm -hmm. Good. And a fair does not necessarily take place for um, invitees only. Fairs are always open to everyone. Because, like we mentioned earlier, it's all about buying and selling. Mm. Now, fairs are often of medieval origin, right? So the central theme is the trading of goods. However, these days, because of, like we mentioned, the rituals and ceremonies being fossilized and reinvented, fairs are now being frequently mixed with leisure and entertainment activities. So you go to a trade fair, and then you will see they are having uh, DJs, artists performing, right? And yeah. all manner of entertainment. Yeah. They have rides for the children. All of these are leisure activities that have been mixed up with the concept of buying and selling. So while mommy and daddy are buying in, in, in different items from the people who are selling there, the children can also be getting entertained, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. a trade fair carries forward the central feature of trading within the, the restriction of a particular industry or sector. Right, but with very little emphasis on leisure and sideshows, which we see happening in exhibitions. So an exhibition can be designed as a trade fair. Does that make sense? Yes. Good. Where you are limiting the the emphasis on leisure and sideshows, even there will be some, even though there will be some form of leisure or sideshow there, it will not be the main emphasis. 
So sometimes people find it difficult to distinguish between fairs and exhibitions, you realize? Myself. So in Ghana here, every exhibition is called a fair. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you noticed that? <laughs> yes. They call every exhibition a fair. Mm. Yes. But now we know that with fairs, the emphasis is mainly on buying and selling. It's not just, it's, it, it, it does not look to generating leads or just introducing products to the market or getting people to become aware of what a particular manufacturer or supplier has to offer. And with fairs, there's also an emphasis on what? Leisure. So there'll be a lot of leisure and entertainment activities going on at the same time that the buying and selling is also taking place, right? So a typical yeah. example is the Mikasa Home and Property Fair. You go there and the music is blasting, but at the same time too, there are so many property companies who are trying to sell you some kind of property. They're either trying to sell you land or an already developed house, or they're trying to sell you a mortgage, right? or anything that has to do with homes and properties. And this is usually held annually, right? Over a two day period. So you can organize a fair that is dedicated to a particular item or a particular product or a particular sector, right? Yeah. So what's a typical example of a fair that you would like to have, Jifa, if you were organizing a fair? Will it be the Ghana Restaurateurs Fair? <laughs> yes. Where people can come and showcase the food they serve at their restaurant. The food they serve, yeah. What makes their food different from all other restaurants in mm -hmm. Ghana? Mm. Uh -huh. So like I said, the level of innovation and creativity is limitless. It's up to you to be able to think outside the box and think about what you can turn into a commercial event that will earn you some kind of revenue or mm -hmm. what you can organize for the organization you are working in that will earn you your, your props or your promotion or earn you the credibility you deserve as the head of protocol and events for that particular organization. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, so aside fairs, we can also talk about festivals. Now, traditionally, festivals are a sacred or secular time of celebration that is marked by special observances, right? And they are one of the most common forms of cultural celebration, many being traditional with long histories, right? And some being more recently created in, in the recent decades. So when we talk about festivals, we can talk about festivals that have long histories, like what festival do that Sanchez celebrates that has a long history? Aquisidae. Which other one, Babo? Babo, you were saying something. Aquisidae and good, right? These all have long histories, but they are still being celebrated to date, right? And they are all marked by parades and processions and common uh, festival elements like um, food. There are certain food items that yeah. are specifically prepared during this period, like the Pepe doing the Homowa festival for the guns. That's the only time that they prepare that food specifically for the festival to celebrate that period of time, right? Mm -hmm. Now, many mm -hmm. of the other major types of events, especially arts and entertainment, are frequently found within or as the theme of festivals. So you see that when you go to festivals, you get to experience different forms of art. When you go to Akwetu Kesi and Akwetu Dai, that's when you see all these unique outfits and regalia. There are certain ornaments that Otunfo does not release unless it is Akwetu Dai or Akwetu Kesi. Yeah. True or false? True. Good. True. There are certain outfits that you will not see the chiefs or the fetish priests the lower chiefs or the queen mothers wearing unless it is festival time, right? There are certain towns too that you will not see any form of recreational or sporting events taking place unless it is festival time. Mm. So realize that during the festival time, there are soccer matches, there are beauty contests, there are contests relating to farming, depending on what um, the people in the area specialize in. Some will go to um, hunting, right? Mm. Which, which festival has to do with hunting? The one that they hunt the, the antelope. What's it called? Um, it has a name. Oh, yeah. Is it Bahamui? Um, 
Abwache. Abwache. Good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So these are all sporting and recreational events that are built around the history of these festivals and are also used to create entertainment during the period of the festival. Right? Now, yeah. there are various kinds of festivals. The same way we in Ghana have so many different kinds of festivals that we, we, we commemorate. In other parts of the world, there are different kinds of festivals. Some of them you would consider outrageous, right? But they exist. Some too you would consider pivotal and they also exist. So we are about to see a number of video cases on festivals that, should, that would open our minds to the concept of festivals, including those ones that come from long histories of tradition and the ones that have just been recently created in the last decades by people just to, to, to create some form of entertainment or sport or leisure. Please, am I making sense? Yes, thanks. Good. Harriet, your hand is up. Doc, sorry to deviate a bit. Um, please, I wanted to know the time frame for um, our lecture, our, our, our lectures, because um, uh, we, we started around 5.30, it's 7.42, so I wanted to draw your attention on the time too, and then know the limits we, we are supposed to take this lecture to. I think it's 5.30 to 8.30. Okay. Because yeah. the first, the first um, timetable they brought us, it was 5 to 7. Yeah, now it's 5.30 to 8.30. Okay. Okay, five. By the timetable that they shared. Okay, thank you. Yes, it's 5.30 to 8.30. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right, Harriet, go ahead. Uh, no, no, I was just adding to it as as your class rep. I wanted to monitor the time too. So. Yes, please. I'm very grateful. Thank you so much <laughs> for monitoring <laughs> on my behalf. Harriet is tired. So we are going to watch a video, right? So we are going to watch two videos. The first one has to do with um some of the, 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 the amazing festivals that are celebrated all over the world. And then after that, we will look at another video that talks about some of the strangest festivals that people celebrate in the 15 world. amazing festivals. That do not make any sense to some people, all right? <laughs> but these are festivals that are important to people and they celebrate it religiously every single year. Mm -hmm. So I'm sharing the player with you now. Can you see the player? Yes. Good. Amazing. Good. Let me. Okay, so I'm sharing sound. Please, can you hear the sound? Balls to experience around the world. Did you hear the yes. sound? Yes. 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 Great. So let's watch it, and then we will we we, we can discuss the content of it. All right. Okay. Welcome to Alux.com, the place where future billionaires come to get inspired. Hello, Aluxers, and welcome back for another exciting and thrilling video presented to you by our team here at Alux.com. No matter what your favorite food or favorite type of music is, there's bound to be a festival to celebrate it. There are craft festivals, food festivals, liquor-themed festivals, seasonal festivals, and all kinds of strange, unique ones like the Fainting Goat Festival in Tennessee, the Mud Festival in South Korea, and the Underwater Music Festival in Florida. No matter what festival you choose, choose to go to, you can be sure to find bright colors, good vibes, awesome food, lots of great music, and many happy, cheerful people. Some festivals are just known locally while others are world famous. We scoured the globe to find the most amazing festival experiences that different countries have to offer. Some of these will definitely be familiar to you while others you'll hear about for the first time. We hope to inspire your travel plans and open your eyes to the diverse entertainment options available in cities all around us. So let's get started. Number 15, Exit Festival, Novi Sad, Serbia. 
Located in the north of Serbia in a city called Novi Sad, the Exit Festival made its debut as a protest against the political party in power at the beginning of the 2000s. Now, almost 20 years later, Exit is one of the best music festivals you can visit while in Europe. It takes place in a medieval Petrovaradin fortress. It's one of the most interesting locations for a big music festival. Each year it brings more and more satisfied visitors, and with its unique location, you can only imagine the feeling of walking through medieval tunnels while dancing to your favorite beats. Number 14. Pingxi Lantern Festival, Taiwan According to one legend, the Pingxi Lantern Festival originated from the period of Three Kingdoms, when one Chinese statesman created lanterns to send military signals. This practice spread through villagers who wanted to let their families know they are safe by sending lanterns into the sky. Fast forward to today, the Pingxi Lantern Festival takes place on the last day of the Lunar New Year, which is one of the brightest, happiest, and most heartwarming festivals you could visit. Lit lanterns are released into the sky looking as if the stars have just come down to Earth. If you get the chance to release a lantern, make a wish and let it fly with the stars. Number 13. Tomorrowland, Boom Belgium one of Europe's biggest and most famous music festivals is Tomorrowland, and it most definitely justifies its popularity as Belgium's jewel. This EDM festival is one of a kind, with world-famous DJs, more than 15 stages, and an extraordinary venue with giant disco balls, industrial sculptures, and lots of confetti. Tomorrowland is a festival you want to experience. The festival offers great fun, remarkable music, and a world-class atmosphere. Number 12. Apelia Fire Festival, Lerwick, Scotland I hope you're free the last Tuesday of January next year because you're not going to want to miss out on this old traditional Scottish festival dedicated to celebrating Viking heritage. With 24 hours of marches, exhibitions, shows, and food stands, it's easy to lose track of time when you're visiting the Apelia Fire Festival. Of course, the best party comes in the evening when participants gather around the replica of a dragon galley and walk around it while singing The Norseman's Home. Then they start throwing fiery torches at a crescendo of cheers. Don't miss the chance to experience this remarkable fire festival because it only happens one day a year. Number 11. Oktoberfest, Munich, Germany the world's most famous beer festival welcomes beer lovers and everyone else, too, to enjoy the festive atmosphere of this world-famous event. Oktoberfest is all about trying out different types of beer, wearing traditional German outfits, and enjoying the overall happy atmosphere of the cheerful hosts. You can take your time since this beer paradise lasts for 16 days, so if you still haven't tried all the beers you wanted to, there's no rush. From late September to the first weekend of October, make sure to stop by and see why more than 6 million people visit Oktoberfest each year. Number 10. Bonnaroo Music and Arts Festival, Manchester, Tennessee this isn't just any music festival. Unlike other music festivals you may know of, Bonnaroo is not only an amazing place for all music and art lovers, but also people wishing to participate in eco-friendly, sustainable initiatives. This festival offers hundreds of acres of Tennessee nature, numerous impressive pieces of artwork all around, and performances from a wide range of artists like Eminem, Paul McCartney, The Beach Boys, and Tool. In addition to fantastic lineups each year, you can find many art workshops Workshops, craft workshops, a cinema tent, and even some yoga. Number 9. Whirling Dervishes Festival, Konya, Turkey this fascinating annual festival commemorates the death of 13th century saint Mevlana, commonly known in Turkey as Rumi. This Islamic scholar, even after 750 years, is the best-selling poet not only in Turkey but in the United States as well. He believed it was possible to communicate with God through music and dance, and that's what this festival is all about. You can see the whirling dervishes, who are men in traditional white or colored skirts, who can twirl with the music in the most mesmerizing way. This is one of the most breathtaking dances you'll ever have the chance to see. Number 8. La Tomatina, Valencia, Spain 
If you're looking for something fun, cheerful, and crazy, this is one of those festivals you cannot miss. Held annually, this gigantic Spanish tomato-throwing festival is one of Europe's favorites and most controversial. Of course, they have set rules to prevent visitors from hurting each other, some of them being no hard objects and requiring tomatoes to be squished before throwing them at someone. It's a completely new experience for everyone who comes there for the first time, but also an unforgettable one. After the tomato fight, you must attend the enormous shower that follows and dancing in the streets of Valencia. Number 7. White Knights Festival, St. Petersburg, Russia the name White Knight comes from the magical phenomenon that happens in the lovely city of St. Petersburg when the sun is present from May to July, so it doesn't get dark. Of course, Russians have to celebrate this event by organizing a beautiful festival that consists of a series of ballet, opera, and classical music performances. There's probably no better way to experience the true beauty and elegance of Russia than by visiting this festival. Also, the Scarlet Sail is a huge part of the White Knight's festival festival when incredibly illuminated boats pass through followed by some amazing fireworks. Number 6. Dia de los Muertos, Mexico Dia de los Muertos, commonly known as the Day of the Dead, is far from being as scary as the name might imply. This holiday is all about gathering with your friends and family to remember the ancestors and deceased loved ones who've helped you on your spiritual journey. With colorful decorations everywhere, this festival has a vibrant spirit that's unlike any other. You can also witness some traditional customs such as ofrendas, where festival participants build altars, prepare food, and gather gifts for their deceased. If you're looking for a colorful and festive celebration, then look no further than Dia de los Muertos. Number 5. Mardi Gras, New Orleans, Louisiana Mardi Gras in New Orleans is one of those festivals you wish lasted longer. If you're fond of parades through the city, costume performers, wild performances, and fire concerts, you will not be disappointed by the legendary Mardi Gras. This is the time of year when New Orleans is packed with people in cheerful and colorful outfits with beads flying everywhere. You can smell tempting foods from nearby food stands and hear music that invites you to come and dance. The tradition of Mardi Gras first began in 1830 37 to celebrate Fat Tuesday before Christians observe Lent before Easter. Number 4. Holy Festival, India Holi, also known as the Festival of Colors, is held in India and some parts of Pakistan during spring on the night before Holi, when people gather to sing, dance, and spend time with each other while celebrating good, conquering evil. The next morning is reserved for the carnival, where participants color each other with dry powder and colored water, making the whole environment electric with vibrant colors. You can enjoy marching bands, dancing, food, drink, and of course, lots of fun. Number 3. Harbin International Ice and Snow Sculpture Festival, Harbin, China one of China's most unique attractions is the Harbin Ice and Snow Festival that takes place from the end of December until the end of February. Home to some of the biggest and most astonishing ice sculptures, this festival is a true fairy tale for winter lovers and anyone who appreciates good art and lots of fun. What you're going to experience here, you can't find anywhere else. The city is made entirely out of ice and snow. Ski tours, ice fishing, and walks through the amazing illuminated replica of a city are going to leave you in awe. Number 2. Carnival in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil a festival that gathers nearly 5 million people each year, from visitors to performers, the Rio de Janeiro Carnival is a spectacle of surprises, thrills, good energy, samba, and wild open-air performances. During these five days, everyone sets loose so you can only imagine the atmosphere you're going to experience. Parades, balls, crazy costumes, and a loud samba will surround you and will inspire you to dance, enjoy, and have fun. Originally, Rio Carnival started as a religious celebration before the 40 days of Lent, which was the last day Christians could eat abundantly before Easter. Over the years, the festival has grown into an epic celebration that is world famous today. Number 1. Burning Man, Black Rock Desert, Nevada 
Finally, we've reached number one on our list, and as hard as the choice was, we believe Burning Man is deserving. Just about every person who attends describes it as one of the most amazing and unforgettable experiences of their lives. The Burning Man Festival began in the summer of 1986 in San Francisco, when one artist made a nine-foot-tall wooden figure of a man, dragged it into Baker Beach, and lit it on fire. After that, the wildest parties were born. Over time, that wooden man sculpture grew to an amazing 79 feet, and the music only got better, and the whole experience was taken to a whole new level. The event is described as a contemporary art and self-expression experiment, and people who have been there claim you must attend it to truly understand it. Well, Aluxers, we've reached the end of our list. Are you inspired yet? Whichever festival you choose to attend, you won't be disappointed. Be okay. So that's our first video, right? And you, you could see the length and breadth of the article, so of, of the festival, sorry. So you seen the Mardi Gras festival I was talking about? Good, and you see that one is also organized around the same time before Easter. Yeah. Good, so it's, it's the trademark of carnivals. So of all the festivals we saw, which one was your favorite? Difa, which one was your favorite? October 1st. October 1st. Like, are you a beer drinker? <laughs> no. Surprisingly enough, the name and yeah. the beer. <laughs> yeah. Drinking beer for 16 days straight. Yeah. yeah. The kind of things people will build a festival around. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Arias, what about you? <laughs> all, the, all the 15. I wrote them down. You all like all the of them? <laughs> yes. Then when you get money, you know where to travel to. Yes, oh, yes. COVID restrictions are lifted. You have a lot of places to visit. Yeah, I, 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 I would talk about definitely, it. Definitely, you would like one more, more than all of them. Which one was it? Um, it's definitely the real. The real, yeah. Very yeah, colorful yes. and fun. That would be yeah. my first destination. Yeah. But um, I'll go yeah. to the rest. Yeah. <laughs> Kasim, what about you? Um, Rio, uh, Carnival in Rio is good. Yeah. I, I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> With two million people in the streets every day, I mean, yeah. you will not sleep <laughs> till you leave the place or till the festival is over. Good one, Kasim. Papa, what about you? Which one was your favorite? The tom tomato fight in Spain. The Yes. That's a good one, but a crazy one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. So now I'm going to show you another video that talks about 16 of the world's strangest festivals. Now, okay. a, a few of the ones we just saw are in there. I think that the one about the Tomato Festival is in there and then another one. But there are even more crazy festivals. Mm. And we are going to see them. These ones are just outrageous. So let's quickly look at them and then come back and then have a, a discussion on them. Okay. Okay, so I'll quickly share the screen now. Please, can you see the screen? Oh, yes, please. Great. Yeah. All right, let's get into yeah. it. Sixteen of the world's strangest festivals. In a world rich with culture, there are countless traditions and festivals that we have yet to experience. From Scandinavia to the depths of Asia, we explore the world's weirdest festivals that people partake in annually. Though they may seem bizarre, they're part of what makes the given culture distinct. Each tradition is linked to a deep history that is preserved with the festivals coming alive each year. Today, we explore these unique and eye-opening festivals that are bound to be added to your bucket list in life. But first, before we begin this video, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more daily tips like this and turn on notifications so you never miss our new videos. Ah, 
Culture, expression, tradition. Sure, these next couple festivals might be weird, bizarre, or strange, but they showcase such a beautiful bout of diversity and culture that we can't slight them in the least. Look upon these next few traditions, dear viewer, and rejoice, and maybe add a couple of these odd festivals to your bucket list. Heck, why not try them all out? Number one, La Tomatina, Spain. First, we look at a bizarre festival from the Spanish culture, which is sure to leave a stain and a splat. The world's biggest food fight is in Banyal, Spain, where thousands of people gather to launch squash tomatoes at one another. The rules ensure that it's a respectful environment where nobody gets hurt. We have to wonder if the whole town is colored red afterward, but we think we know the answer. Number two, Burning Man, USA. The next weird festival comes from right in our backyard. A strange occurrence that's American as a festival can be. For eight days in the Black Rock Desert, people gather to enjoy a festival of art, freedom, and self-reliance. In this spiritual experience, people forget about their everyday living and form a new, developed society of fresh principles and values. From anecdotes told to us by those who have been, we've heard of such strange traditions from parachuting in every year to trading water for illicit substances. Far out, dude. Number three, Battle of the Oranges, Italy. Much like the Spanish, this strange and bizarre celebration of Italian culture involves pegging each other with food. In Avera, Italy, it's a food fight that involves chucking oranges at opposing teams. The winning team is decided by a judge and ultimately honored by the town. Helmets are required as oranges become a safety hazard. Same as Spain, is the whole town colored orange after this big battle? Only those that participate know. Number four. Day of Silence, Bali. This traditional Indonesian festival is less weird and more of a showcase of the culture from which it originates. The island of Bali welcomes the new year with peace and calmness. Fire, travel, and entertainment are forbidden. Traffic and electricity are shut down for 24 hours to allow self-reflection and meditation. Number five, Monkey Buffet oh. Festival, Thailand. This festival is fairly odd. At least, it sounds pretty odd. We're from North America, so it's safe to say we don't encounter a lot of wild monkeys. However, we were under the impression you weren't supposed to feed them. Despite that, in Thailand, during the Monkey Buffet Festival, 4,000 kilos of dishes are served at the temple for thousands of monkeys. This is to honor them as they are said to bring good luck. The city of monkeys ensures each monkey is fed and treated well. Number six, El Colacho Baby Jumping Festival, Spain. Ah yes, <laughs> yet another odd tradition from Spain. Seems things get pretty boring in La Piel de Toro, no? We're just kidding, but get a load of this strange Spanish festival. The Spanish village of Castrillo de Marica gathers each year, where men dressed as devils jump over one-year-old babies, a ritual to protect them from bad luck and rid them of sin. We can only pray that none of these men mess up. Dios mio! Number seven, Taipusam, the Hindu piercing festival. This Hindu tradition sounds like it hurts, but really, who are we to judge? And you know the old saying, don't knock it until you try it. Nevertheless, in Malaysia and Singapore, Hindus pierce their whole bodies to show devotion to religion and cleanse their sins. More than one million people take part annually. Number eight, Pikachu Festival. Japan. We remember a time when Pokemon was all the rage. Kids used to trade cards in the playgrounds, except the energy cards. Nobody needed those. And we used to compare who had the coolest Pokemon. It seems the Japanese never got over this fad, as every year they take part in a tradition called the Pikachu Festival. The famous anime cartoon character is the subject of a parade, where over 1,000 performers take the streets dressed as Pikachu. Fans show their devotion every year in Yokohama, Japan. Number nine, Boryang Mud Festival, Korea. Ever seen mud wrestling? Have you ever thought to yourself, what a lowly redneck sport. I would never be caught dead doing something so filthy. Well, first, lighten up. 
And second, you must not be Korean. Attracting the largest amount of international visitors as far as Korean festivals, this mud mania includes obstacles, slides, wrestling, and even a mud bath, all coming together for an electric atmosphere. Number 10, the Songkran Festival, Thailand. All right, remember when we went back to the days when Pokemon was all the rage? It was like two points ago. Come on, keep up. Anyway, those were also the days when we'd have huge water gun fights in the summer. We remember turning from kids to elite water gun warriors, sneaking through the jungles and using tactics to gain the upper hand on the enemy. Well, if that all sounds fun, then you should try all that, but ride on an elephant. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the world's biggest water gun fight. During the Songkran Festival, the entire country of Thailand aimed super soakers at each other to bring in the new year. Some even using buckets or elephants. Yes, you heard that right, elephants. Is it cheating if the elephant sprays you with its trunk? Number 11, Festival of Holi, India. Have you ever been to a paint party? Maybe a club where you dance all night and smear each other with paint? If any of what we just said appeals to you, maybe check out the Festival of Holi in India. Yeah. The people of India are engulfed with colored powder to celebrate the triumph of good over evil. The Festival of Colors involves smearing and throwing an array of colors, creating an inviting atmosphere for all ages. Yes, that means you too. You're an age, aren't you? Number 12. Wife Carrying World Championships, Finland. We were confused when we heard this title too, but turns out the tradition follows the name to a T. The husbands of Finland compete in a wife carrying competition where they carry them over 253 meters. There are obstacles along the way, such as an ice pool, a true test of marital bonds. Number 13, Kanemara Matsuri Festival, Japan. Children, avert your eyes because this one is about to get dirty. It's the wacky Japanese again with their strange tradition honoring everything phallic. There are wiener-shaped lollipops, wiener-shaped glasses, giant wiener-shaped statues. The wieners are endless. Why Japan would do a festival honoring wieners is beyond us. But then again, most of what Japan does goes over our head. Number 14, Air Guitar World Championships. Finland. Ever get down on yourself because you want to be a rock star, but are really musically challenged? Are you so unable to play an instrument that even if you had to save your life, you still wouldn't be able to? Don't worry, Finland has you covered. Every year in August, the people of Finland gather together to rock out. Just songs instruments. The organizers state that the event is to promote world peace, even going as far as to say, according to the ideology of the air guitar, wars would end, climate change would stop, and all bad things disappear if all the people in the world played the air guitar. That's definitely a good sentiment. Number 15, World Bog Snorkeling Championships, Landwarded Wells, Wales. All right, so we're going to leave Finland and Japan alone for a while and instead focus on this, frankly, kind of gross festival in Wales. Apparently, every August, the people of Landwarded Wells in Wales will gather together for the World Bog Snorkeling Championships. This is a tradition in which competitors armed with snorkeling gear compete to see who can make it through a 120-yard peat bog the fastest. The event has been described as intense. Hmm, this is one thing you definitely couldn't do in Florida. The snake and alligator related deaths would be through the roof. Number 16. International Hair Freezing Contest, Yukon, Canada. Ah uh, yes, good old Canada. Home of maple syrup, hockey, and free healthcare. It's also the home of brutal, unforgiving winters that make you wish for summer to return after this festival is done at least. If you head up to the Yukon, one of Canada's territories, during March, you'll be able to compete in the International Hair Freezing Contest. It's pretty much what the name implies. You freeze your hair into strange, bizarre, and odd shapes, and we assume you're judged based on wackiness. The competitors of this competition are described as fierce fighters, and that's just as well, because what the heck else are you supposed to do in the Yukon? And that's it. Are there any festivals we forgot? 
Got a cool festival story you want to share? Let us know in the comments section below. Okay. So another wacky one, huh? <laughs> so which one was the craziest for you? This I will start from, from the bottom. Papa, which one was the craziest? The, the piercing body. Hey! Mm -hmm. <laughs> that one I couldn't even watch. Did you see the size of the needles and metals people yeah. were passing through their, their faces? And... Oh, it's so crazy. Hey. But it's a yeah. festival, oh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> and they said how many people participate? Millions. Is that what they said? Millions. Yeah. <laughs> That's serious. Yeah. <laughs> Kasim, what are you? Which one did you find the craziest? Uh, equally, the, the the piercing one and the the narrow the narrow canal that they have to be meandering their way, uh, regardless of uh, uh, reptiles, you know. Exactly. Uh, what happens present. if somebody dies from a bite? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dangerous, <laughs> reckless, but it's a festival and people are participating because yeah. they find it entertaining. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Serious. Thank you, Kasim. Harriet, what Very about you? <laughs> Baby jumping. Spin. Baby jumping. I was asking myself, who would give my their one-year-old baby? I should be my baby for you to jump. <laughs> <laughs> it won't happen. Though. It won't happen in Ghana. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Hey, baby jumping. Wow. This but the, is the, it is something that they enjoy. They do it every year and they get babies. Mm -hmm. That's the scary part. <laughs> they get babies. It's wow. It's for protection or something. But this one. Hey. No. <laughs> <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, that's another festival. Yeah, if hey. somebody messes up, the, the baby will be in hey. a hospital, hospital yeah, or something. Exactly. <laughs> The process of the jumping, someone shouts or something like the attention is is divided or drawn somewhere. You are uh -huh. dead. You are killing. Yeah. yeah. It's a festival. <laughs> Anything can happen. Someone can just throw something at you. It's a festival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they find and it entertaining, and they participate <laughs> every year, every <laughs> single year. They get okay. babies. This this one is not fun because boobies are involved, you know. Uh, the, rest, the rest are all matured people trying their craziness. But this yeah. one is not fun because uh, the babies uh, can't speak for themselves. I know I know plenty of babies lying down who, who don't want. <laughs> I, I agree with you, madam. Yeah. But this one is uh, not fun at all. At all. Babies yeah. are very fragile. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They must be respected. And, and since, since they're not doing it willingly, since their mothers are doing it for them, it's not exactly. Even... It's not fair. Kifa, what about you? Which one did you find the weirdest? Hello, Jifa. Can you hear me? Perhaps Jifa is having some challenges. Mm. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Perhaps she'll join us when, when she reconnects. But Madam, there is this, uh, the first video, the yes. Coco is, is, is a, um, what is the name? Uh, Coco. It's a cartoon, man. Eh? Maybe, maybe you, you have to let us watch the one that's, um, the oh, dead. Oh, the, the, uh, the day of the dead. Yes, they will come back to life. Uh, they'll come back and then come and yes. eat. And go is like the one day of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Mexican if festival. If family, yeah, if your family doesn't put up your picture, it means you can't cross the border or the airports of the dead to the living to go and then have fun with your family because it will be it will be like they believe that your family have forgotten about yes. you, so they don't want. It's a it's a movie. It's actually a cartoon. Yes, it's an cry, animation which is based cry. on the actual festival. Yes, I like that one so much. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's go and watch again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow, it's so nice. <laughs> yeah, it indeed is. 
Okay. So these are how far mm. festivals can go. In fact, for me, my favorite one was the Day of Silence one. The one that is celebrated hey, no, in Indonesia. No electricity, no fire, no music for 24 hours. In Ghana here, when you put off the light for five minutes, <laughs> they said do so. Oh, welcome to my world. Hey. Then you intentionally do it for 24 hours. The whole <laughs> country will turn upside down. Or Kasim, you can survive. Bravo, can you survive 24 hours? No fire, no electricity, no sound, no music to reflect on yourself and your life. I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think it is something that Ghanaians will find very easy to do. And I found it interesting that they've been able to turn it into a festival. Because to be able to turn it into a festival, mm -hmm. looking at the amount of opposition that may come, it only, it's only a testament mm -hmm. to how far we can go in terms of what we as events managers and, and planners can create when it comes to events. Yeah. 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 The options are limitless. We can yeah. create an event yeah. around anything and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody can. We can create an event around that, anything and everything. Oh, okay, Jifa. Yes. Yeah, which one did you find the weirdest? The baby jumping. Ah! <laughs> she's a mom. She's a mom. So the first thing we got is the baby jumping. That one mm. is crazy, eh? Yeah. Mm. Mm. But it's a, it's a testament to the level of creativity and innovation and how if you are an astute event planner and organizer, you can create and sell anything, mm. right? Depending on how mm. well you are able to sell it, you can create an event around it. So the ball is in your court, ladies and gentlemen. Start thinking about things you can create events around. Yeah. Will you create an event mm -hmm. around shoes, TVs? People manage to create an event around the Premier League in Ghana. Mm -hmm. to the point where everybody wanted to get some of the jerseys. Wow. So you can create events around anything. And this is the, the precursor to the assignment I'm going to get in creating an event. After our second lecture on creating and designing events, you will be tasked to create an event and tell us the genesis of this event, what it, it, it's built upon, whether it is built upon an old tradition or some historical event, or it's just something that you came up with or created that you believe has commercial value and you can, you can design and sell as an event. So start thinking about it from now. What would you want to build your event around? Please, I hope that makes sense. Yes, please. Okay, so let's continue. Subsequently, we can talk about sporting events. These ones are very popular all around us. We have various tournaments and championships from soccer to tennis to rugby to um, croquet, volleyball, handball, all manner of sporting events take place around the, the calendar year, right? Depending on what your interests are. I am personally very, very um, interested in gymnastics. So I like watching the gymnastics when it's on. Other people love tennis. For other people, it's soccer, right? But depending on your interest, there is a sporting event that you can participate in at a specific time of the year, right? Depending on whether you are a spectator or you are an actual player in that particular sport. Please, I hope that makes sense. Yes. So a typical example, like we mentioned, is Wimbledon, right, which has become famous for uh, the tennis tournament. And the Wimbledon is the oldest tennis tournament in the world. And it is still being held to date. So that tells you how when an event becomes established, it will just continue to sell itself throughout the years. Does that make sense? Good. 
and you will not have to do much as an organizer to promote it anymore because people have become accustomed with it and they will participate no matter what. So on the back of that, what are the motives for people participating in these events that we have observed? And as we can see, there are myriad events, several different kinds of events all over the world that people participate in, right? And when we look at the kinds of events that we have seen, we cannot use the classic and often overquoted theories like the motivation theory or Maslow's hierarchy of needs to try and explain why people participate in these events. Because it's not as straightforward and clear cut as that, is it? Yeah. No. So scholars have been able to come up with ways by which we can classify the motives for which people participate in these events that are, is impossible to do using these traditional theories of motivation and Maslow's hierarchy. And these can be grouped into primary and secondary motives, namely social motives, physiological motives, personal motives, and organizational motives. Now let's look at each of them one after the other. When we talk about social motives, what are we referring to? We are referring to motives relating to social interaction with others, creating a community spirit, status or recognition, right, of your achievements for participating in these events, and then charitable contributions. Some of these people participate in these events because through their participation, the proceeds in the event go to support a particular charity, right, or philanthropy. Yeah. In some, for some people to, based on the community that they belong to, if you don't participate in the event that is being organized, you do not belong, or you are not part of the in crowd. Have you heard that thing too before? Yes. Good. So these are all social motives for which people will want to participate in an event. There are also physiological motives. Some people just participate in the event just to entertain themselves and to relax. So someone will go to October 1st just to relax for 16 days and drink all sorts of beer. Yeah. Some of these events too, based on the theme, people will participate in it for the purposes of sexual enjoyment with others. Because as, aside from the general recreation that people enjoy, a lot of these events are also hubs for promiscuity for people. Do you realize? Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. events like the Rio Carnival and others. So people go to these events mainly for this purpose. Others also go for the purposes of exercise and the physical challenge, like the wife competition, where men have to carry their wives over 250 mm -hmm. <laughs> with obstacle courses and jumping and things. This is exercise, proper physical challenge, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And for some people, they just participate to eat, drink, and be entertained, like October 1st like tomatina, yeah. throwing tomatoes at each other. They are just entertaining themselves. We can also talk about personal motives. And yes, some people just want to seek new experiences. Their lives mm. are boring. They want to experience new things, new cultures, so they will participate. For others, it's about exploring and getting creative. Some of these events involve participating in different activities that will enhance your creativity. For some people too, it is their ambition. Like the way Harriet is telling us that her main ambition is to attend all these events. Oh, yes, yes. So once she does it, she has fulfilled a personal ambition or a personal motive mm -hmm. that she had. And then finally, mm -hmm. we can talk about organizational motives. Some organizations participate in these events through sponsorship or by buying mm -hmm. a stall or setting up their tables during the events to be able to sell their products to all these participants because these events attract mm -hmm. a lot of people. So for companies that have products to sell, it's an opportunity to make extra sales, true or false? Yeah, true. Oh. Some organizations too will sponsor these events for publicity yeah. and to let people know of their presence. Because if you are yes, sponsoring yeah. an event that is attracting about 2 million people, by the time the event is over, everybody will know the name of your product. Mm -hmm. Some organizations do it for status and recognition. If you are the company that sponsored the Rio Carnival, that attracted all these number of people over four days, that means you are a very huge company. You have a lot of resources and you are forced to be reckoned with. And for some companies too, it is for community support. They are based in the community. So they will give some money to the community to support their festival, to show that they have the community's interest at heart. 
like the way the Ghanaian organizations do during the festival period, Casa Preco will go and give a number of cartons of mm. dry gin, Guinness will go and mm. give cartons of, of Guinness and other products to chiefs and other queen mothers and, and other leaders during um, festivals within the communities to show their community support, right? Mm -hmm. So these are the yeah. four main motives according to Shonen and Parry 2010 for participating in events by individuals at various levels. So how are hospitality and tourism and events related? Now the term hospitality generally refers to the hotel, restaurants and entertainment industry. And in relation to events, hospitality can generally be understood to include any products or services that are offered to consumers of an event. So people at these events, we can see if they traveled from a far away destination, would need a place to stay, wouldn't they? Yes. And while they are there, they will eat, wouldn't they? And while they are there, they will need to be entertained, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. yes. And that is the business of which industry? The hospitality industry. And that is how hospitality and events are related. Even the venue yeah. that the event is had, various levels of hospitality services are needed, including mm -hmm. attendants, yeah. waiters and waitresses, concierges, cleaners, receptionists. These are all actors within the hospitality industry, aren't they? Yes. They are. Good. So this is how events and hospitality are related. Now for tourism and events management, tourism is a social, cultural, and economic phenomenon which entails the movement of people to countries or, place, or places that are outside their usual environment. And this has to be for less than a year. So if someone moves to a different location for more than one year, it's not considered tourism. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. So it has to be less than one year and it has to be for personal or business purposes. So when you go to these places, either for personal or business purposes, they need to be able to get involved in certain activities once they go to these places, don't they? Because tourism provides opportunities for them to engage in all these activities. So as event managers, tourism provides opportunities to organize various events to engage these individuals or professionals, right? And this can be done in various multicultural environments. So events are in some way a motivator for people to engage in tourism because people will not travel from their usual environment to a new location without knowing that they are going to experience something new, would they? Yeah, they will. Yes. They will move because of the motives we have talked about, the psychological, mm. social, organizational, and personal motives. So events yeah. help to be able to fulfill the motives of which people will engage in these activities. So event management is a function of the hospitality industry and hospitality is a core component in every event that we organize as we have identified. So proper event management is important in building the reputation of various players and actors in the hospitality industry. Because if we organize an event and all the actors involved, including the caterers, the hoteliers, the restaurant, and the performers don't do their job well. It will affect their reputation, wouldn't it? At all. Good. Because these people who are participating in the events will judge the performance of each of these players in the hospitality industry and how well they were able to serve them. Likewise, when it comes to tourism, Events are one of the prime means by which we are able to attract tourists to specific destinations. Like I said, you need to give someone a reason to leave their own environment, to move to another environment, especially when it's off peak season. Because you know, there are certain periods where people usually like to travel. Mm -hmm. There are certain periods where people just don't travel because they, they have mm. work. So they want to stay within their local environment as much as possible. So an event is the only way you can actually motivate somebody to leave their current environment, to move to a different environment. And because of that, event management can be used to trigger a boost in tourism by increasing the number of tourists that visit a destination. Because the events and how they are organized is what is going to attract them yeah. to those destinations. 
And by doing so, these destinations will now become hubs. And they will be established in the minds of tourists because they would have become synonymous with these groundbreaking events that are being organized. You realize that in the videos that we saw, all of the events that they talked about, the festivals, were associated with a particular destination, when they? Yes, they were. Good. So they mentioned the festival and they mentioned the destination that is known for. The Harbin yes. Festival is Harbin, China. Yes. The Day of Silence is Bali, Indonesia. The Holy Festival mm. is India, right? Each of the events is known for, each of, of the destinations is known for a particular event and vice versa. So yes. events um. and hospitality and tourism are synonymous with each other because they, they operate in a synergistic manner where they go hand in hand to be able to fulfill the objectives of actors in all of the three sectors that have been mentioned. So without events, tourism will suffer and hospitality will also suffer uh -huh. and vice versa. Without hospitality, events will suffer. And without hospitality, tourism will also suffer. Because when the tourists come, where will they stay? Who will serve them? Who will feed them? Right? Yes. So in a nutshell, these are the foundations of events management. And these are the oh. basis upon which we are going to build in the subsequent topics that we will be discussing throughout this course. To be able to come to an understanding of how we can achieve successful events management. And by the end of the course, hopefully we'll be able to achieve all the four learning outcomes that are stated in your course outline. And you will be happy that you selected this particular course as your elective. And with that, we've come to the end of the session.